In this video, we're going to have a look at the Otto cycle, how it approximately represents a gasoline engine, and how we can derive the thermal efficiency of an engine operating by this idealized Otto cycle. So this is my crude representation of a gasoline engine or within the chamber of a gasoline engine. And we've got the intake valve here and the exhaust valve. Now, if we had a perfect gasoline engine, it would have a thermodynamic cycle that looks like this, where we have two adiabatic processes at the top and bottom here and two isochoric processes or isovolumetric processes. So we're going to start off at state O here. And this is the start of the intake stroke. So this is where air and gasoline are coming into the chamber here during the intake stroke. So the piston is moving down and a gaseous mixture of air and fuel is drawn into the cylinder here. And as this occurs, this chamber, the volume in this chamber increases. So we're moving to a higher volume. But you also notice here that the pressure hasn't increased. So the pressure stays at atmospheric pressure. So that's one atmosphere of pressure. And the volume is increasing from V2 to V1. So when the piston has lowered to its furthest point, we're at state A. And that's where the volume within the chamber is at its highest amount of V1. So now when we're at state A, the engine performs the compression stroke. So we go from state A to state B, but we do so adiabatically. So this is an adiabatic process. Now, what does this mean? So an adiabatic process is one where there's no heat exchange in or out of the system. So in our case, the piston is compressing so fast that all this internal energy or the change in internal energy is caused by the work from the piston and not from any heat exchange. So we don't have any heat coming in or out of the engine. But as the engine is undergoing the compression stroke, the air intake valve closes, piston moves up and compresses the air and fuel mixture in this chamber. And as it compresses this air fuel mixture, its temperature rises. And you can see this here on our PV diagram. So TC is our isotherm as we draw in this air fuel mixture into the engine. And as we compress it adiabatically, its temperature rises as we move to state B. And you'll also notice here that the volume within the chamber goes back to V2. When we're at state B, we've heated up the gas and air mixture and the spark plug here triggers combustion. Now, as this gas and fuel mixture explodes, it happens so fast that the pressure increases almost instantaneously, but the volume remains fixed. So this is an isochoric or isovolumetric process. You, but you'll also notice here that the temperature increases up to this isotherm here. Now, when combustion occurs, the potential energy stored in the chemical bonds of the fuel and air mixture is rapidly released. And this represents our hot reservoir. So we can say that heat enters the system here from our hot reservoir, QH. And we can actually draw a heat engine here to show you a representation of what is happening during this process, where we have the hot reservoir up here supplying heat, QH, to the engine. And the engine is converting some of this heat into work and dumping out the remaining heat into the cold reservoir. And we'll get to this in a second. 
So now we're at state C, where our air and fuel mixture has combusted. And then the gases in the chamber rapidly expand. They adiabatically expand to state D, which means that no heat is being transferred out of this engine or into this engine. Some of this heat from this exothermic reaction is being converted to work. As we hit state D, so what I forgot to do is I forgot to, I forgot to show that this exhaust valve here is closed during this process. So as we hit state D, this exhaust valve opens. And as it opens, the pressure instantly drops down to atmospheric pressure. And as it drops, the remaining heat within this chamber here gets sent to the cold reservoir, which is the outside atmosphere. And the temperature within the chamber for an idealized gasoline engine goes back to T sub C, which is the temperature of the outside atmosphere. In reality, this, the temperature within the chamber is going to be a lot higher than this. So here we can show that the heat is transferred out of the system, the remaining heat, to the cold reservoir. And this is represented by this arrow here. So we can see that not all of the energy from the combustion gases gets converted into work. Some of it has to leave the engine and be dumped out into the cold reservoir. Otherwise, we'd be violating the second law of thermodynamics. So the amount of work here is represented by the area within this closed cycle here. So the very final process involves pushing out the exhaust gases out into the outer atmosphere and going back to state O here. And then the cycle repeats all over again. So what about the thermal efficiency of an idealized Otto engine? Well, if we treat the working substance within the chamber here, the air and fuel mixture, as an ideal gas, then we can use equations derived from the ideal gas law to help us out. So the ideal gas law is PV equals nRT. But for an adiabatic process, so from A to B and C to D, we're going to use this equation to help us out in a moment, where we've got the initial temperature and volume to the power of gamma minus one is equal to the final temperature and the final volume to the gamma minus one for an adiabatic process. And I won't derive this equation now, but if you've covered the kinetic theory of gases, in year one of an undergraduate physics program, you'll be taught how to derive this expression for an adiabatic process. But all we need to know now is that the initial temperature and volume and the final temperature and volume for an adiabatic process is related in this way. And this gamma term here is the ratio of molar specific heats. So Cp divided by Cv. Or in other words, the molar specific heat at constant pressure divided by the molar specific heat at constant volume. And this ratio has a different value depending on what gas we're using. So for a diatomic gas like nitrogen and oxygen, which will make up the majority of our gas within our chamber, our gamma value would equal around 1.40. But we'll get into this in a minute. Now, if we go back to our PV diagram, we're interested in calculating the work done during each cycle. And the value of the net work done equals the area within this enclosed cycle here. Now, from the first law, we know that the change in internal energy of a system is equal to the amount of heat that enters the system minus the amount of work done by the system or by the gas. Now for a cycle, 
the change in internal energy is equal to zero. Because during this cycle, as we extract heat from the combustion gases, we eventually go back to the same temperature within the chamber, or in other words, the same energy. So delta U is equal to zero for a single cycle. So if delta U is equal to zero, that must mean that the amount of heat entering into the system is equal to the work done. Now, according to the second law of thermodynamics, we cannot extract all of the heat from the hot reservoir and convert it into work. Some of that heat gets dumped out into the cold reservoir as exhaust. The amount of work done per cycle is going to equal to the difference between the heat entering the system minus the heat exiting the system per, per cycle. Now for this idealized Otto cycle, when heat is entering the system and leaving the system, it occurs isovolumetrically. And because it's isovolumetric and we're using an ideal gas, we can use these two expressions to find out the magnitude of the heat entering the system and the heat leaving the system. And we can only use these expressions because the process is isovolumetric, where n represents the number of moles of gas and C sub v is the molar specific heat at constant volume. Now we also learned from a previous lesson that the efficiency of a heat engine is equal to the ratio of the amount of work that we can extract from the engine divided by the total amount of heat entering into the system. And this is equal to the magnitude of the heat from the hot reservoir minus the heat dumped out into the cold reservoir divided by the total heat from the hot reservoir. And we can simplify this to 1 minus Q sub C divided by Q sub H. Now, if we plug these expressions into this efficiency equation, we can cancel out the number of moles and the molar specific heat at constant volume, leaving us with this expression here. Now, we can simplify this expression further with the help of this equation up here. And we're doing this so we can represent our efficiency here of our Otto cycle in terms of the difference in the volume between V1 and V2. And this is called the compression ratio. So we don't need to worry about what the temperature is within the engine. During this cycle, all we need to know is how much the gases within the chamber get compressed. So from state A to state B, we've got an adiabatic compression. So we can use this equation up here. So from A to B, our temperature, our absolute temperature at A, multiplied by the volume at A to the gamma minus one is equal to the temperature at B multiplied by the volume at B to the gamma minus one. And we can do the, and we can do the same with this adiabatic process from C to D. So let me write that out quickly. But because these processes here are isochoric or isovolumetric, we know that the volume at B and C is equal to V2 and the volume at D and state A is V1. So we can simplify this even further. So V A is equal to VD, which is equal to V1. And VB is equal to VC, which is equal to V2. So we find that TA, V1 to the gamma minus 1, is equal to TB, volume 2 to the gamma minus 1. And we can rearrange this to make TA the subject. 
which is equal to Tb to the ratio between V2 divided by V1 to the gamma minus 1. Now let's do the same with this expression here to isolate the temperature at state D. Now because we've isolated the temperature at the temperature at A and temperature at D, we can substitute these values back into this equation up here and cancel out like terms. So if I isolated the change in temperature from this volume expression here, and what we can do now is simply cancel out the temperature here, leaving us with this equation here, which can also be written like this, where the volumes V1 and V2 have swapped around. Now, what does this actually tell us? Well, V1 divided by V2 represents the compression ratio of this particular engine. And for a typical gasoline engine, you might get a compression ratio of about eight, where the volume of gases in the chamber get compressed by about eight times. So if we have a compression ratio of eight for our typical gasoline engine, and our gamma value is 1.4, our theoretical efficiency is around 56%. But real engines typically achieve something around 15 to 20%. And this is because we need to take into account things like friction and energy transfer through the walls of the combustion chamber and the incomplete combustion of the air and fuel mixture. 